I guess we all, before we undertake anything, number one, we've got to have it on our heart to do. And there's about three elements, I guess, that I would say that I, when I think about uh, looking back, number one, you've got to hear a voice. Then number two, you've got to listen to it carefully. And then number three, you've got to act. I heard this voice probably for a, at least a year before I acted, so i got to confess that. And that's always been a challenge for me, is listening to that inner voice from God. I've been challenged with that all my life, and not, not listening, if you will. Hearing it, but not listening. And then not acting, uh, because none of it works unless you act. So that's how it all came about, and I thought, boy, you know, we've got the idea of location, uh, we've, we've got the resources necessary to do it, so what's holding you back from doing it? What I remember is one day during one of our morning meetings, uh, as we were closing out the meeting, uh, Mr. Bushman said, you know, I think I want to build a cross on 191, and about 40 feet tall, and We'll have some monuments, and let's draw it up. And that was kind of the, the discussion at that time. So then the, the group that was in the meeting, we all got out of the meeting and say, did we really hear what we just heard? And so then we, we all agreed and um, just kind of took it from there. And then, you know, I kind of tuned into what he was talking about, and I thought, huh. Well, and, you know, I just kind of listened to him and took it in and went home. We finished with our meeting. and. Over the course of the night, I was just sleeping and I kind of started thinking about it and woke up the next morning and came up with this little sketch at five in the morning. I mean, it didn't take 15 minutes to put together. You know, he gave me the, uh, the specifications, the dimensions that they were looking for. So I selected the steel signs, the numbers that uh, would work, would stand up with what they were looking for and designed the foundation. There's a lot of concrete under it as well. And uh, I started thinking about the raw materials and, you know, the, what, what existed back in Jesus' time and what was going to be. Uh, well, Tom, as well as John, had mentioned that, that John wanted an old rugged cross. And from an architectural standpoint, just an old rugged cross is not going to stand out here for any test of time or anywhere. And so I started thinking about, you know, the, the materials that were around back then, which was iron and wood and you know and stone which is what the base is represented by here in the sketch and uh, i just started thinking that you know it needed to be simple yet it needed to be durable and it just needed to tell a story well the first thing we did was just clear the site you know went out with john but they had a survey and we cleared the site and, and then started ordering the parts that take longer to do like the big eye beams that go for the main cross and and trying to locate the timbers that fit on the cross because they're pretty hard to find, some of them 40 foot long. Just the basic structure of the cross itself is a 30 inch high beam uh, that's in the ground about 10 feet uh, and it's 45 feet high and inset in between the eyes of the I beam uh, is uh, wood, one strip of wood that's 45 foot long that runs from top to bottom. Uh, and it is cypress. Uh, we tried to get dogwood. Uh, dogwood uh, is pretty knotty and pretty small tree uh, where I was raised. There was lots of dogwood. I never saw one over 20 feet tall, basically. Uh, bigger than mesquite, but certainly not uh, something that you could uh, get a strip of lumber that's basically 27 inches wide. But it's so remarkable in finding this uh, strip of wood uh, called on the supplier out of Florida is where that, the wood came from. He said he had never seen in his life that he's been supplying wood for people all over the country, that he had seen an unblemished, unknotted piece that was continuous for 45 feet. Uh, we kind of had a, an ending date in mind. Uh, we were thinking about the end of July of 2013 and it just so happened that we missed that date, but it just kind of kept moving forward, moving forward, and um, it, it's, I look back and it's kind of like, in, in life, we all have our own plans and our own agenda, but when God's in control, it's on His timing. 
And it just so worked out because one of the neat stories is the, the cypress wood that is on the cross. Uh, we were trying to find, you know, at least a 40 foot span to get a, a, a piece of wood that would go from top to bottom. And so we found a place in Florida and after the wood was cut, the gentleman that uh, had been working in the, the wood yard, so to speak, called Glenn Lynch back and said in the 40 years that he has been cutting wood, he has never seen a 40 foot span from a tree that did not have any knots or woodpecker holes or any blemishes whatsoever. So if we would have finished in July, we wouldn't have gotten that wood. And maybe that's God's plan that we just got the, the perfect piece of wood for the cross. He said, all these little trees have woodpecker holes. He said, we'll have to try to do something with it, you know. And I said, okay. And so anyway, I called him back on Monday and uh, he said, hey, he said, I got them cut. He said, I want to tell you, he said, uh, he said, Mr. Lynch, I've been cutting timbers for 40 years. He said, in 40 years, I've never cut a timber that didn't have a knot hole, or a tree hole, or a woodpecker hole, or nothing in those beams. And those beams didn't have none of that. I mean, they were just real clear. According to the man that harvested it, said it was the most perfect, unchecked, unsplit, unworked piece of cypress that he had seen in forever. And he thought it, there was, might be some divine intervention just in finding that piece of cypress. My biggest challenge, um, you know, one of the main pieces out there is the Ten Commandments and um, it's 12 feet tall and four feet wide, which is a, a very large piece of granite. And to find that is difficult, but there's a place called the Living Stone in Llano, Texas, where we have purchased other uh, pieces of granite for 10 commandments at some of uh, our other properties. And it took time to find that granite and then to inscribe it and get it delivered. And then we also have the other four uh, tablets with Bible verses on them and then the Matthew 517 tablet. Uh, I called on Jimmy Brassel, our, our minister, to find out what scripture in the Bible that he thought best uh, described the connection between the Ten Commandments and the cross. And uh, he came to the very quick uh, conclusion that was Matthew 517, which basically says, uh, Jesus says, uh, I come here not to destroy the commandments, but to fulfill. Uh, John asked us, uh, and kind of the whole group, you know, come up with your favorite Bible verses because we want to have something more than just the Ten Commandments. And so we kind of, you know, went back and forth and came up with a list. And little do we know, he kind of had his own list and some of his favorites. And as we kind of talked and put them all together, with Genesis 1-1, it started from the beginning, you know, God created the heaven and the earth, but we wanted to kind of have a storyline, get uh, bridging the gap between the beginning and the end, and the most important piece being the cross. Well, as far as the people in the community, we all live in a rush, rush lifestyle, I'll call it. We're all on the move. We got different pressures to get places quickly, particularly those traveling 191. Got a, a lot of oil field truck drivers, uh, a, a lot of guys that's got to be somewhat quick, and frankly, they're working 65, 70 hours a week in a lot of cases. So we're just hoping that the community, those driving by, will, will view these monuments and be touched by it. And if they don't have time to go to church, at least see it and be inspired by it and understand the hope that comes uh, with the Ten Commandments and the cross, that regardless of our circumstances, uh, Jesus is always there for us. And we're just hoping that it will inspire them, maybe turn their day around. I think it's a great way to demonstrate our faith and to get people asking about it. You know, those who are Christians and driving by there, they see it and it, it's a reminder. Those who are not, well, maybe it's a get you to ask. Maybe it's something that will make you stop and think. What I hope for the community that they can get from the cross or from the site or from the tablets or the verses or, or anything out there, whether it could be a cactus tree or the landscaping or just turning into the parking lot, we want a sense of peace and we want um, somewhere 
where people can either drive by, think about it for a second, or drive by, stop, and actually go in and, and maybe have a time of prayer. Um, there's so much busyness and so much that goes in everybody's life every day that hopefully this will be an outlet to, to bring some hope and inspiration and maybe bring somebody closer to God. I think it, it's a good thing for the community. I think it ties together both communities, Midland and Odessa. Like John said, it's a sign of hope. Um, I just, and it's just, I think it's a great testament to, to God and, and Jesus. I mean, that's exactly what it is. A lot of people go through a lot of stuff. And when you go through stuff, Sometimes you just need something to remind you that hey, there's, there's somebody that really cares. And, and when you're alone, <clears throat> out at a place like that, uh, is God can speak to you, and He will. He will speak to you, and, and you can get in touch with you can get in touch with Him. He's always waiting. Tonight to dedicate and commemorate uh, these. We, we want this call it the cross. The others accompanying uh, monuments are there to cooperate the story of the evolution of God or our evolution and understanding where God came from and the connection basically between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we're just so thankful to have the opportunity to present this to the Permian Basin because of all of you in attendance here today. This display happens to be right on the city limit line. It's just inside by about 50 feet of the Odessa city limit side, but essentially right on the line between the what's called the ETJ Exit Territorial District. That means a void land between here and Midland, void land between here and Odessa. It's included technically in the ETJ or the city limits, but anyway, it's right on the line and we're hoping that this, as the Lord has no boundaries on His love, none, period, every man is loved, every woman is loved, every child is loved, we should, between the cities, love each other as He loves us. Very important, and that's what this display hopefully will accomplish over time. On this symbol here, the dedication uh, piece back here, right at the base of the cross, what it actually says is, as we May God's love and blessings be on anybody who views these monuments and believes. Uh, that's all that that says, and we truly hope that that happens to many. If we can touch one life that turns to Christ as a result of this, we will have accomplished our mission, and we hope that it's here forever. With that said, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to dedicate uh, these symbols of our love for you. And we're thankful for everything that you've given us. We're thankful for the families that you've given us, the good health that you've given us, the prosperity in this, this area that you've given us. And we're just thankful for that love and grace that you and mercy, Lord, uh, above all mercy that you give us each and every day because we all know that we're sinners. We all know that we need your love. We need your forgiveness. And for that, we'll be rewarded only by believing in you to be in your house with you and your son, Jesus Christ, in the afternoon. We thank you, and in the name of that Son and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you all.